Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, where we're going to discuss the evolution to date of the Artemis program, taking you back to the very beginning through to the end of Q4 2023, and culminating in the current state of the program. We'll go through the origins of Artemis, and the people whose names you should know that were involved in the decision-making processes, along with many of the steps and missteps along the way. And we're going to keep the politics involved here to a minimum, in the episode and in the comments section, but we are all aware that each new federal administration comes in with their own new set of priorities where NASA is concerned. Ever since Kennedy decided to beat the Soviets to the moon in 1962. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. And the Americans did beat them. From the time Kennedy made this speech, it took NASA only seven years of dedicated work to perfect the Apollo program to the point where Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins conducted a flawless Apollo 11 to great fanfare and international attention. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Roger, twin. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The Apollo moon landing program ran for seven missions, Apollo 11 through 17, with only Apollo 13 not reaching the moon. Apollo 17 splashed down on December 18th of 1972 and concluded that program. Nobody has set foot on the moon since. The Artemis program, the current moon landing program, was announced on December 11, 2017, exactly 45 years after Apollo 17 touched down on the moon. The announcement made by then-President Donald J. Trump and his Vice President Mike Pence. In case anybody is unaware, currently in the American system of government, the Vice President of the United States is the senior government official directly involved with NASA as the chair of the National Space Council. Created in 1989 under Bush Sr. and Dan Quayle, as a modified version of the National Aeronautics and Space Council that it replaced that ran from 1958 to 1973. That council was mothballed in 1993 when the Clinton-Gore administration was sworn in, remaining inactive through George W.'s tenure and through Obama's as well, during which time the shuttle program and the shuttle replacement program were both shut down for good, costing America the ability to send its own astronauts to space. For his legacy project, Trump brought the NSC back online in 2017, when Pence and Trump signed the White House Space Policy Directive No. 1, setting out the ambitious goal of landing humans on the moon again by the end of what was expected to be Trump's second presidential term ending in 2024, giving NASA the same seven-year time frame it took them to perform that task in the 1960s. The directive I'm signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery. It marks an important step in returning American astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972 for long-term ex exploration and use. This time, we will not only plant our flag and leave our footprint, we will establish a foundation for an eventual mission to Mars and perhaps someday to many worlds beyond. To aid in meeting that deadline, Trump nominated Congressman Jim Bridenstine of Oklahoma as the 13th NASA Administrator in September 2017. Bridenstine was sworn in by Mike Pence after an extended and sometimes painful nomination process in April of 2018. Two years after announcing the Moon Initiative in December of 2019, Trump made another huge announcement creating the fifth arm of the U.S. military called Space Force, attaching it to a $738 billion defense bill and reiterating the 2024 deadline for landing Americans on the moon. To that end, Bridenstine had NASA working up a program paradigm that would not only get human feet back on lunar soil, but would create a system where this could become a regular occurrence instead of a singular spectacle. And in September of 2019, three months prior to the Space Force announcement, NASA had already put out an open call for lunar lander proposals for the program they named Artemis. Several teams submitted bids for consideration, vying for one of the two available contracts. Three teams were picked for further program development on April 30th of 2020. Blue Origin led the national team that included Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Draper, 
each in charge of a major component of the system. Dynetics Human Landing System Team used talents from 25 specialized subcontractors to put together their design proposal. And SpaceX took their concept for HLS from their Mars Starship, modifying their most recent CGI file by removing the heat shield tiles and coloring it white to make it look more like a lunar lander. Musk at the same time was convincing venture capitalists that his 2016 BFR, renamed Starship and revealed in 2019 to great fanfare at Boca Chica, Texas, was going to be sending multiple Starships loaded with supplies to Mars in 2022 to await the arrival of the first Mars colonist in 2024 that would lay the groundwork for his city of a million people on the red planet by 2050. Compared to Mars, the moon should have been easy money for a machine that Musk had been making CGI animations and grand promises about since September of 2016, when he first introduced the ship at a conference in Guadalajara, Mexico. Case in point about a grand promise, the 2018 TED Talk with Gwen Shotwell, promising point-to-point -point rockets on Earth for human travel within a decade. I mean, Gwen, come on, this, this, this is awesome, but it's crazy, right? Like, this is never going to actually happen. Oh no, it's definitely going to happen. This is definitely going to happen. So you really believe this is going to be deployed at some point in our amazing future? When? It will be within this decade. Within a decade. Not this decade. That's certainly amazing. Um. <laughs> Just over four years to go, Gwen. Not liking your chances on making good on that promise. To finance moving the three lunar lander proposals forward, NASA awarded $579 million to the national team, $253 million to Dianetics, and $135 million to SpaceX. For the next year, the teams were to work towards the objective of designing, building out, and testing their proposed vehicles. But before the year was over, the biggest unpredicted problem facing this program would rear its head and change the landscape of this competition. Not knowing what was to come, the three teams went about their business. To make sure they were on the right track in August of 2020, the Blue Origin team delivered a full-scale engineering mock-up of their three-stage machine to the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility in Johnson Space Center's iconic Building 9. The purpose of the 13-meter tall mock-up was to allow NASA crew to get a feel for the machine, see what works, what doesn't, how panels or controls should be positioned for the crew. It allowed NASA to provide valuable feedback that Blue Origin would then take into consideration for new revisions. Importantly, the lander Blue Origin created was already compatible with existing launch systems and technology, capable of being launched on any heavy rocket. In September of 2020, Dianetics delivered their mock-up as well, again working with the NASA staff to collect information and feedback. Their team provided this concise explanation for the goals of this interaction. We're using this test article for what we call human-in-the-loop task analysis. Simply put, it means we're looking into things like habitable volume, how much space does the crew need to eat, sleep, and live, anthropometric accommodation, how much space do the astronauts need to do every one of their many jobs, how can we make those jobs as easy as possible? And how can we make the space as comfortable as possible when they're not working? Placement and orientation of op components, stowage, and interfaces. Is everything easily accessible? Have we minimized necessary movements? If something goes wrong, how easy is it for the crew to assess the problem and get access to the solution? Intravehicular and extravehicular activities. Can the astronauts move in and through the vehicle comfortably, safely? How easy and safe is it for the crew to exit the vehicle onto the lunar surface and then get back in again? At this point in time, while Blue Origin and Dianetics were already delivering full-scale walkthroughs, empty Starship test articles were just starting to make hops and attempting to land. SN8 left the first of many craters in Boca Chica on December 9th of 2020 during their attempt to land. Super Heavy was still sitting on a drawing board, and no full-scale HLS mock-up was delivered to NASA for their staff to review. Although SpaceX were conducting their first tests on a cable crane required to get astronauts from the Starship airlock, to the surface 30 meters below that hatch. Of course, wire crane platforms like this were something never before accomplished on Earth. And while Musk was treating Southeast Texas like his own private destructive testing range, NASA was still waiting for Musk to deliver on the Crew Dragon system they had contracted from him, something Administrator Bridenstein had to publicly remind Musk about. Jim called Musk out on the mat on Twitter after Musk began to focus on Starship instead of delivering the Crew Dragon. Musk was awarded Crew Dragon Development Approval on September 16, 2014 in the same announcement for the Crew Commercial Program that included the Boeing Starliner. First Crew Dragon demos were to be conducted by 2015 
leading to a functional delivered system by December of 2016. However, NASA wound up spending billions of dollars buying seats on a Russian Soyuz craft to deliver U.S. astronauts to the ISS in the time between when the Crew Dragon was supposed to fly in December of 2016 and when it finally entered service in 2020. In that time, 20 American astronauts had to buy tickets on Soyuz vehicles at an average cost of $81 million per seat. That's over $1.6 billion extra dollars that NASA had to fork out because SpaceX didn't stick to their promised delivery schedule. Meanwhile, Musk was promising that, within a couple of years, his followers would be able to buy $100,000 round-trip tickets to relocate to Mars on Starship. And that was pretty much the state of affairs when the U.S. went to the polls in November of 2020 in an election that surprisingly cut Trump's expected presidency in half. Joe Biden took office in January of 2021, Kamala Harris taking over from Mike Pence as both Vice President of the U.S. and the new chair of the National Space Council. Once again, with the change of administration came a change of priorities for NASA. And those changes were reflected when NASA's 2021 operating budget was announced. Jim Bridenstein, as a former Republican congressman, knew the Democratic president and VP would be replacing him as administrator at NASA, and he had no intention of continuing in his role for them, even if they asked. His resignation was handed in less than a week after the election results were finalized, on November 9th of 2020, leaving the administration of NASA to interim deputies until Bill Nelson was nominated by Joe Biden on March 19th of 2021 and sworn in as the 14th administrator of NASA by Kamala Harris on May 3rd of 2021. Which creates what we believe to be an issue. Because the HLS final selection for multi-billion dollar contracts was hastily announced on a Friday afternoon two weeks prior to Nelson getting sworn in by someone acting of their own singular accord by the name of Kathy Leaders. Leaders took it upon herself to make the HLS selection after Bridenstine left office and before his successor was sworn in. Further, she awarded a single contract instead of the two that were expected to be announced, and she awarded it to SpaceX, the only company to not provide a full-scale concept mock-up, who, leading up to April of 2021, had crashed SN8 on December 9, 2020, and SN9 on Groundhog Day 2021, SN-10 exploded on a landing pad on March 3rd of 2021, and SN-11 was launched into the morning fog of March 30th of 2021, which didn't even make it back to the ground before it exploded, covering the local protected areas with giant chunks of scrap metal shrapnel. That was the state of SpaceX HLS when Kathy Leaders single-handedly awarded Elon Musk the sole HLS contract to return NASA to the moon. In looking at the 24-page announcement published by NASA regarding her selection process, it needs to be noted that the entire document is written by Kathy Leaders in the first person. My role. I selected. My final determination. And so on. While there is mention of a panel of advisors called the Source Evaluation Panel, herein called the SEP, this decision was not reached by committee. It was decided by and signed off on by Leaders alone before her new boss, Democrat Bill Nelson, could get sworn in. In her words, from the introduction on page 2, In my role as the Source Selection Authority, SSA, for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA or agency, Human Landing System, HLS Option A procurement, for the reasons set forth below, I have selected Space Exploration Technologies Corp., SpaceX, for an HLS Option A contract award. This selection statement documents my independent analysis, and judgment as the SSA and constitutes my final determination on this matter. From page 3, on April 2nd, 2021, I made a determination that it would be in the agency's best interest to make an initial conditional selection of SpaceX to enable the contracting officer, or CO, to engage in post-selection price negotiations with this offeror. Of course, April 2nd of 2021 completely predates when this source selection announcement came out. As contemplated by the solicitation, the government, meaning leaders, instructed SpaceX that it was permitted to change certain price and milestone related aspects of its proposal, e.g., which should be IE. The government requested a best and final price as well as updated milestone payment phasing to align with NASA's budgetary constraints. Neither of the other two companies were afforded the same consideration or information as leaders says right here. After I reviewed this revised proposal 
and consulted with the SCP chairperson and CO, it was evident to me that it would not be in the agency's best interest to select one or more of the remaining offerers for the purpose of engaging with them in price negotiations. Following a final review of the offeror's SEP report and SpaceX's revised pricing proposal, I made final option A selection and award determinations as documented herein. Her summary of evaluation results, found at the top of page 8, showed that the Blue Origin lander only had a technical rating of acceptable, despite being compatible with pre-existing launch technology, and they were given a management rating of very good. SpaceX was also given a technical rating of acceptable, despite having no proven or compatible launch technology, no mock-up, and an extremely complex mission architecture. And they were also somehow given an outstanding for their management rating. We know now, as we knew then, that rating was extremely overstated and undeserved for reasons that become very obvious later. The entire document goes on like this, and we are going to pick it apart shortly, but there's another document that we have to introduce you to first. News of the Soul Award came as a shock to the other two contenders. Both Dianetics and Blue Origin filed protests with the Government Accountability Office, since the HLS competition from the outset had always been for two proposals to move forward into the contract phase. Musk, in typical Arrested Development fashion, couldn't help mocking Bezos with a prepubescent dick joke, even though Musk basically insider traded himself into the Solo Moon contract. In similar fashion, Musk also mocked the design of the original Blue Origin lander with a lame dig about sexual frustration, something that Musk apparently seems to know a great deal about. The GAO rejected both protests, so Blue Origin went further and filed suit against NASA in federal court, arguing the agency failed to properly evaluate its HLS proposal. And from here, we can go to the redacted court documents to discover exactly what happened from Blue Origin's viewpoint. One of the biggest issues facing all parties at this time was the fact that because of the change of administration and their change of priorities, that led to a change in NASA's budget allocation. Artemis was no longer being funded at a level that allowed for two competing HLS systems. There was only barely enough money now for one, thanks to a Senate appropriations bill that was presented the day after Jim Bridenstine handed in his resignation. This bill knocked the HLS allocation down to $1 billion from Bridenstine's request for $3.2 billion for fiscal 2021 at his September 23, 2020 hearing on NASA's budget request. This information was not relayed by Kathy Leaders at NASA to all the offerers. That information was only given to Elon Musk. Leaders displayed textbook favoritism to SpaceX through this action, poisoning the entire process. And that was the basis for the Dianetics and Blue Origin protests.